because there's always going to be the deeper physics science oriented answer to any of these questions i mean any anything about the trumpet like yeah the world operates on physics like we can always go down to that but most people don't uh find that learning physics makes them a lot better at the trumpet so and we have all this gear available and we're being hit with marketing for gear all the time so having a way to sort of sit through all that information is i feel really important this episode contains adult language and adult humor since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults if you are easily offended by these types of conversations consider switching to the oboe welcome to the trumpet guru saying podcast i'm your host jose johnson my guest for this episode is John Kaplan. John is a self-professed trumpet nerd. Besides being a gifted orchestral player who has studied with many of the great pedagogues of our time, John has an insatiable hunger for gaining and sharing knowledge about all things trumpet. As the host of the wildly popular John Talks Trumpet YouTube channel, John delivers regular doses of insightful information in his quirky and entertaining fashion. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. Welcome to another exciting episode of the Trumpet Guru's Hang. And this time, I am joined by um, somebody who's probably is almost... Maybe actually is one this the uh, bigger nerd when it comes to trumpets than I am, the one and only John Kaplan. John, thank you for joining me, my friend. Hey, Jose, thanks for having me, man. Oh, this is so great. I have been a fan of your channel, your YouTube channel, uh, John Talks Trumpet. And um, yeah, I, I guess for people who have, have watched your stuff, it's that really engaging mixture of the quirky and the super super deep detail uh and it's the kind of stuff that i love you know it's, it's like one of my favorite shows uh when disney plus came out was uh, i forget the name of it now it was a jeff goldblum show and every episode he was like talking about you know something like you know ice cream or rvs or something like that but it was done in that very quirky jeff goldblum way and so the information was so deep but it was it was so entertaining i just couldn't get away from it and that's what i feel about your podcast um or your video series wherever wherever you want to classify it. it's that really balance of entertainment and education so you know i guess let's start with that what has driven you to create that content? Okay. So I have to go back to when I was growing up. So I started to play trumpet when I was just before sixth grade. My parents were sort of tired of me not having a hobby. Uh, and so they sent me to University of Miami uh, summer music camp. It was just for a few weeks. And they asked, what instrument I wanted to play? And I was like, cello. And they were like, okay. But for the second two weeks, you need to have another instrument. So what's that going to be? I was like, and I literally had completely nothing in my mind, like just nothing, totally blank. And then the first word that came out was trumpet. Amazing how that worked out. Um, and so when I, through middle school and high school, as I got more serious in the trumpet, I was also like finding myself to be extra passionate about um, equipment and reading like trumpet herald forum i mean that was already well into it's like healthy heyday by the time i got to high school and so i even started posting there i mean you can go find my own post <laughs> that's like just proof i was a high school on trumpet herald and that community was so kind and so giving with information that it just totally inspired to be more and more nerdy as i got older um i, I seriously i had a bookmark folder when i was in high school on my desktop um that had just links to like various mouthpiece websites and brands and stuff <laughs> I didn't know that that was like not normal, but it was just, I don't know. That's what I spent a lot of my free time thinking about. So then I went to Arizona State for my undergraduate degree, and I studied with the uh, incredible professor David Hickman. And as much of an impact as he had on me playing wise, the biggest impact I think he had was, now I haven't heard of any other schools that do this, but he has a pedagogy repertoire class, which I know many schools do have. Um, but he, his class is three hours on Friday afternoon, and it involves his juniors, seniors, all of his master's students and first or second year doctoral students all together in his office. And, um, 
he would spend half of it going over, you know, solo repertoire and the rest of it talking about trumpet pedagogy. And the combination of those two things was really interesting. But the, the kicker was that every year he assigned, I can't remember if it was two or four research papers per student with firm deadlines um, that were 10 page research papers. And this was meant to like train his students to write excellent dissertations because, you know, he, he was especially well known, I think, for having very, very many extra qualified doctoral candidates and, and people get jobs in universities and stuff. And so I think that's what was the tilt of course was. Um, so I started taking this course my junior year and submitted my first research paper, happy that I'd word vomited all the stuff I could think of on whatever subject he assigned me. I think it was tit versus dorsal tonguing. And I got the paper back and it was just completely bleeding, murdered red ink. Like the thing was destroyed and I didn't understand it at first. I was like, I put everything I thought I knew about the subject. And he was like, yeah, but those things just came from your brain. Like in order for it to be a proper research paper, every single thing has to be sourced from somewhere. You are not an expert. I was like, oh, and my whole world changed. He he showed so much devotion to that process. Like he would turn in a paper, he would send, give it back to you with like 10, 15 revisions. It would take months. We would just be giving it back and forth, more corrections. He was so committed to veracity and preciseness. So that sort of gave me the, they gave me the bug of just what, being interested in doing research in the first place and also getting an understanding of how to actually do it. Um, as I kept getting older, like I, I went to my master's degree and I started working in the Charlotte Symphony, I realized that my passion for equipment far exceeded that of most of the people that I was talking to about equipment. <laughs> like, I mean, understandably so, like every, but we all love trumpet, but like not every trumpet player is gonna be as obsessed with that aspect of it as apparently I was. And the more, um, I realized that I cared so much about it, especially when the pandemic hit and I was sent home from my regular job, just uh, loving to play second trumpet in the Charlotte Symphony. Um, I felt this energy coming out of me that I just kept wanting to talk about trumpet, even if I wasn't actually performing right now. Um, so that became the prototype of John Talks Trumpet the YouTube channel. I started a list of like, I don't know, I had to prove to myself I had enough ideas to actually make a YouTube channel. So I made a list of like a hundred. And when I got to a hundred, I was like, oh, I have so many more. Okay, I think we're gonna do this. Like, let's just go ahead and get started way before I'm ready. My first ever video, please everybody just go look at it so you can see how far I've come, you know, in terms of production value. It was on this amazing product, the book of solos, which was edited by Michael Wilkinson. It has 30 solos. I the response I got that was so positive and, and encouraging, and I just I, don't, I couldn't resist. So here I am now, be a year and three months later, um, and I think I'm around 2,300 subscribers. Yeah, and that's great. I mean, somebody I started I started this podcast uh, right about the same time, uh, just as the pandemic was starting. Even though that wasn't when I was planning, I was actually had already been planning to do this podcast. It just was one of those things where that was the timing, um, but that growth that you've seen um that's really something to be proud of i mean that that's that's not easy to gain that many followers in that short of a time so i i certainly want to pick your brain on that because that's you know that's what we're all trying to do is is to get more noticed and uh you know get those uh, subscribers and and get all those youtube bucks that that are coming in uh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, but let no. me tell you. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, no, please, please. Okay. So, a little bit about like my background with YouTube. I, people asked me within a year, friends of mine would be like, oh, would you ever want to do a YouTube channel or something? You know, a year before the pandemic. And I always say, definitely not. I will never do that, actually. <laughs> I was so <laughs> sure I would never do that because I just didn't think I had the personality for it. But then I looked back on, my last five to six years of actual media consumption in my personal life. And like, yeah, I watch Netflix like a regular person, I guess, but most of my media is YouTube. And I just find myself getting sucked into these little super niche subjects for a few months at a time, just because I'll find a few creators that are really good and really inspiring. And it just could be anything. I mean, there was some time I was really into Rubik's Cubes and I was like, not only buying all kinds of different ones with different shapes, you know, different solving patterns, but trying to learn as much as I could about solving that stuff. I still have them somewhere, but you know, it was such a temporary thing. It showed me the power of like what good communication on YouTube could do. I mean, it pulls people on the subjects they didn't even know existed. 
Um, so for me, when I started the channel, I already had all of this um, experience having watched other YouTube creators. And one of the first things I did was start looking up YouTube help content because YouTube is just huge. I mean, there's so many people starting new channels every day that, and it's so much work to make a video that you don't want to get started and feel like you didn't do a little bit of research first. I was really hesitant to actually wait because I knew that if I waited too long, I wouldn't actually get started. Um, but so I started watching some videos on these channels. One is Think Media. Another one is a guy called Nick Min. And both of them are really into YouTube help content. And I so I started to internalize a lot of the things that they were telling me that were um, that helped me get my channel set up, basically. So at the, I think one of the things that's helped the most is that my channel name is really self-explanatory. And the theme of my videos is all 100% on that subject. So anybody comes in, watches any of my videos about trumpet mouthpieces or whatever, they look at the title, John Tuck's Trumpet. They look at the thumbnails of my other videos, more mouthpieces, more trumpets. You know, I guess the connection is strong. Just like when I started watching those, um, you know, puzzle videos. And so that has been helpful. Um, it's definitely been at times difficult to resist the urge to like do lots of different kinds of content. You know, I love to play the trumpet too, but I find my primary <laughs> emphasis in, in my mind, it's just, I default to writing scripts and thinking about these, you know, equipment ideas um, when I think about creating content. And I know that my audience, I'm sure they would love to hear me play more, or maybe they would, but it would also leave out a bunch of people who only came because they wanted to hear what I had to say about mouthpiece. So that's just sort of gives you a little glimpse of the kinds of thought process I go through when I'm picking a video subject or when I'm just making few decisions about branding on a channel and that kind of stuff. Because really the, the the mission of the channel is just to make all this information accessible to everyone. Like I picked up this stuff from some sometimes on Trumpet Herald from when I was really young, but from a lot of industry professionals that I got unlucky to spend time around. When I first moved to Charlotte, uh, I found out that Greg Black his shop is, is really close by. It's about 30 minutes from, from where I live. And so I started going out there a lot to just do really basic little things like get a rim threaded onto something else or, you know, change the outside blank of a mouthpiece. I say they're simple because Greg made them look simple, but honestly, he's just an artisan. Like he's a, mach he's a machine artist and he stands there and he literally just measured my Bach mouthpiece with calipers and then recreated the outside with his eyes and hands. It's unbelievable. Yeah what he was able to do. But from just spending time around that shop, coming in, getting various projects done, getting thrust altered, back horse changed, cup things changed, uh, I had a lot of chances to learn, you know, pretty important things about mouthpieces. And the longer that I was a fully professional orchestra musician, I realized that a lot of my colleagues maybe hadn't really dove into it very much. And when I was telling them about it, I noticed that I would take forever to get to the point. Like I talked to them for an hour, two hours about, know mouthy's throat or backboard and understandably there's completely zoned out by the time i'm done i'm like okay okay john how about you how about you start making these videos and you find a way to make this information concise and presentable to everybody well you know john it sounds to me like um you are a very passionate man and uh you know <laughs> as you as you crack yourself up um it, and what I love, you know, it, what I what I found funny, not in, in a ha ha way, but uh, was that you said you didn't think you had the personality to do a, ch a channel, and I think your personality is perfect for this kind of a channel because you know I know a lot of guys that know a lot of stuff about gear. I could listen to them for about a minute and a half before I'm I'm completely zoned out. Uh, you are just so passionate. You're so engaging and you're so entertaining and it's like uh you know the the fact that you even you know start out you know you know welcome trump trumpet nerds uh you embrace that uh that nerdiness that we all have and uh you know it was this was this something that was that's natural for you i mean you know it is is this your personality like when you're on a gig and when you're doing other things or or is this safe for us trumpet guys yeah i think i think honestly it's me like i think probably most people who know me in real life i'm way too i'm very talkative in rehearsals it can be a little bit of a thing i've had to get control of it's just checking myself from getting too excited in the middle of a conversation because <laughs> I, I do get to I do tend to get fixated on things as I get passionate and then 
maybe I looked out of my watch and I've been talking for 20 minutes. You know, I've been very lucky to have friends that were not only very good natured and very good humored, but also patient. <laughs> and over time, I think talking to my friends about all these things helped me hone uh, the actual skill of explaining it in a high level of detail in a way that was understandable. Because there's always going to be the deeper physics science oriented answer to any of these questions. I mean, any, anything about the trumpet, like, yeah, the world operates on physics, like we can always go down to that. But most people don't uh, find that learning physics makes them a lot better at the trumpet. So, and we have all this gear available and we're being hit with marketing for gear all the time. So having a way to sort of sit through all that information is, I feel really important. And, uh, and that's where I was going to trumpet Herald and early YouTube as well. I mean, there were some great, great channels that, that featured equipment. Um, and those guys were also inspiring to me. And so for what I'm doing, I feel like it was just an outgrowth of that. Uh, plus, maybe some of the more modern YouTube flair. Yeah. Well, you know, the, that's kind of interesting because, you know, you're talking about, you know, the world operates on physics. And I, I've done this, and I guess this is one of the reasons why I, what you do resonates with me so well or so much, is that um, in terms of uh, the way I've, I've functioned uh, as a, a musician and as in my, my life as a martial artist and things like that, uh, and in my current position as a as a consultant, is there are two things that you really have to kind of understand. You have to understand how the outer world works, and that's physics. And you have to understand how the inner world works, and that's the psychology. And so uh, I think that that when you can look at any problem from you know what are the physical manifestations, what are the things that are, that are having to occur, the actions. Uh, and then what are the, the motivators, the intentions, the, the, the thought processes that are creating the actions that are then giving you your results? Um, and I think that's, that's the way to solve any problem. But uh, I don't think a lot of people, uh, they, they want to find a solution to the problem, but they don't want to look at what the root causes might be, whether it's the, the physics of it or it's the psychology of it. So you're diving into the physics is uh is really fascinating and and i was just watching a video this morning uh on it was the one that you did about uh blank sizes the weight of the mouthpiece and that was really a well thought out and well executed analysis of the you know what is occurring why is it occurring and then you know gives people food for thought for if they want to make these kind of changes in their playing these are some of the, the considerations that you have um but I think sometimes we get so gear oriented that we lose sight of the psychology of it. You know, the, the gear is the last part of the chain of the sound production, but that's where we want to put all of our emphasis. But I do think that understanding how and why it works then gives you a, a better foothold on ways that you can create those kind of changes that you need to make your playing work. So even in your early playing, uh, did you find that you wanted to experiment with gear and and that that you had that inclination of and, and like where does your your technical expertise come from? Because I mean, when you're talking about you know bore sizes and weight and and things like that, I mean, you, you know what you're talking about. So where did you pull all that information from? And and uh, you know how how has that helped you as a performer? So you know, I think it's really important to talk about why I'm even talking about equipment in the first place. I get a lot of comments that are like, why don't you just go practice? And they're not directed at me, I assume, <laughs> but perhaps just any person who's watching the video. Like, why don't you just go practice instead of buying a mouthpiece that's two pounds? And it's like, well, yeah, of course you can always do that. And that's always the first thing you should do. Like you should practice a lot. You should play a lot. You should enjoy time with your trumpet and grow a emotional connection to the equipment that you have. The better that you get at navigating that equipment, the more capable you might be at some point of making a small change in equipment that can help you achieve a musical goal that you eventually desire. Um, you know, I feel like you can really only make evaluations of what you need in equipment once you've sort of reached a very high level of control of equipment, equipment you're already playing. I mean, so for me, that started with the first trumpet my dad ever bought me on eBay, a Getson Eterna 700S. <laughs> and I was like, what's a Getson? And I'm in sixth grade and I'm looking it up on the internet. I'm learning about Getsons and looking at the Getson website. And I'm like, wow, what an incredible company. That's so cool. And um, 
by the time I was in seventh grade, I was already doing some junior youth symphony, which is like middle school youth orchestra, as well as, you know, middle school band. And I think my parents picked up on the fact I just like couldn't stop talking about it. <laughs> and so my dad decided to put a, a big chip down on, on on my uh, career and bought me a, a box Stradivarius trumpet. I was a seventh grader and I, I looked at it and I looked at him and I was like, why this now? I, I'm, you know, I don't really understand. I've only been playing trumpet for a little while and he could just see how much I cared about it. And he wanted to make that big investment and show him that he cared and believed in me, but also wanted to give me equipment that allowed me to reach whatever goals I had through high school. Mm -hmm. uh, which is just like, wow, what a vote of confidence to get from parents. I mean, it's just a huge amount of support there. So that was sort of the start of it all. And then they allowed me to buy different mouthpieces or, or whatever. Not a lot at first, certainly. <laughs> I mean, I think the first mouthpiece I ever bought that was not like the Getz in 7C that I had was a, uh, a Chinese megatone mouthpiece off of eBay or something. And I swear I used that for at least a year in middle school jazz band. <laughs> and even then I was like, why is this mouthpiece different than the others? Um, so that, I mean, the, the actual experimentation with, with uh, equipment started pretty early. And then I got my first C trumpet when I was a 10th grader because I was doing so much youth orchestra stuff. Uh, it actually started to make sense. A lot of the music I was being handed was trumpet in C or harder transpositions. And so having a C trumpet made a lot of sense. The first one I ever had was a King Legend C mm. trumpet, which is literally like it had like an extra large bore, reverse lead pipe, single radius, a rounded tuning slide. This thing was a beast, a huge sound, right? And so I spent the whole year playing on this and the Monette mouthpiece I was playing on at the time because my teacher played Monette mouthpieces. You could see how out of hand this had already gotten. Right. Uh, but by the end of my sophomore year, I had suffered to a great degree because of the that C trumpet's uh, very open blowing personality i guess um and i tried just a yamaha Zeno at my local music store and it was just like oh my god i gotta get rid of the king right now no disrespect at all to the king company of course that trumpet is just not the perfect thing for me at that at that exact moment right. i would actually like to play that now and see what i think of it now but um so that yeah. started pretty early but as far as like technical uh familiarity i have to give a big disclaimer so <laughs> i've always had a big interest in math and science but I haven't taken a math or science class since high school. Okay, I should probably put that on the front page of my uh, of my, <laughs> my YouTube channel. There are there are people out there who know and understand the physics and the, the very deep level science of the trumpet so much better than me. And honestly, I just want to know what they know. Like over time, I'm just going to keep picking up stuff that they're putting down and try to get as clear of an understanding as I can. But for now, my goal is just to make the information consumable <laughs> by the average person without without it being like so technical that it's hard to consume or being so casual that it's inaccurate and actually unhelpful right right well and and that's such a a necessary balance i think that you know we have to have uh and that's kind of a, a catchphrase that i use for the uh the work that I do with mindfulness, it's, you know, I, I say what I, what I try to do is I try to demystify the mystical and simplify the scientific because there's, there's so much in the world of trumpet, you know, there's, there's all the trumpet voodoo stuff that people have. And there's, um, there are things that people have said uh, or say, because that's what they have been told. And it may not be the most accurate description, the description, you know, things like uh, use more air or, you know, blow faster, or just, you know, all the kind of things that, that people come up with to try and explain what you need to do physically or, or the, create the correct intention. Uh, and then the science, you know, if we get into the science of, uh, you know, instead of saying just breathe from your diaphragm, of, you know, talking about what muscles have to engage, what muscles have to relax, uh, how do you create the right level of compression, where's the compression created, uh, you know, and talking about things like in the horn, the, you know, the, how the throat of the horn is going to affect the feedback that you get and yada, 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 um, that goes over your head and just makes you want to explode. But, you know, finding that balance where you can give really clear, precise information, accurate information, but in a way that's digestible. And I think in terms of the, you know, the, the state of education, that's one of the things that we need more of. You know, we, we have so many uh, 
teachers who, like most of us, have grown up just with the standard pedagogy, and and you know, you, you you play, you know, if you want to have a big sound, you play a big mouthpiece with a big horn, and you know, yeah, maybe you know, Bud Herseth did that because. He was Bud Herseth, and and you know we all know the stories about why Bud switched over to a, you know, a larger mouthpiece and things like that. That so, a lot of times people don't understand the the rationale for those those switches. But I think understanding having I think it'd be great to have uh, as part of our our standard trumpet curriculum uh, understanding the mechanics of the instrument, understanding the uh, manufacturing process and why certain things create certain effects and, and the balances that, that you can create and change through subtle uh, equipment changes. And it's just something that, you know, most people don't know. So, you know, that's why I think the stuff you're doing is so important because it provides uh, a singular source that someone can go to, to start to get this information. And then if they find something that either resonates uh, that they want to learn more about, or that, and, and many times this is even the better ones. Like, yeah, I don't, I don't buy that. I, I, I'm not sure. And so then you start doing your own research and you find out for yourself. So I think that that this is a, a, a tremendous service. Is this something that that has like been part of your uh, your ideal behind what you're doing? I mean, or, or is is that something that drives you? I mean, it. I think it became that. At first, it was like, I would like to make videos about things that I'm always talking about and explaining to people so that I can just send them a link and be like, here, <laughs> this is the best explanation I have. So some of my first earliest videos, like, um, there's just a video where I just describe all the modifications on my B flat trumpet, because I have a vented valve, I have a pitch finder, I have an extra slide stop, why would I have those things? Those aren't that typical. So making a video explaining why. So there was that, you know, and I made a whole video about vented valves, a whole video about pitch finders eventually. Um, but it did become actually, like, I think, especially with one of my more recent videos, the, the weight video that you mentioned, I did probably in October or November last year. And that was when I first knew I hit on something I really liked. I was like, ooh, I'm taking something that people actually don't understand that well, frankly, blank design and blank weight. It's one of the things we experiment with the least because we have one mouthpiece and many mouthpieces are similar blanks anyway. And all we know about the different weights is whatever our teacher tells us or whatever kinds of things we can observe. But then there's too many variables because of the differences in between on the inside of the mouthpiece, unless you have two completely identical mouthpieces. Um, so then, and I can't remember when it was, maybe March or April, I started talking to Doug at Venture about this, you know. Uh, we started working together more. I made my initial video about the Venture Mouthpiece um, design process in, I think it was March. And so after that video was done, we started talking about like, what other things could we do together? And I was like, could you just make me a really super heavy mouthpiece? <laughs> he was like, like what? And I sent him a picture of um, Peter Pickett made a really heavy mouthpiece for ITG or something once, right. maybe like five to 10 years ago. And I've seen a picture of it floating around on the internet. Um, and David Cookie Cook from Cookie's Music uh, had actually played the mouthpiece and I talked to him about it. And first of all, Doug from Venture was like, of course we can do that. Definitely. And it was done with an incredible amount of speed. Like it was an exact copy of my mouthpiece we'd already developed. But instead of it being um, 92 grams, it was 800 grams. <laughs> and just looking at it, holding it, it was shocking. But just the concept of it is like, well, what does weight actually do? If we just can blow it completely out of proportion, what's going to happen? Um, and the response I got to that was really strong. But also, I felt personally like, we learned a lot just from the process of making the video. Uh, at first, it was even a little bit more of a sciencey video, but I mean, come on, the mouthpiece is ridiculous. <laughs> like, you got to have the science, but it's also just silly. I mean, you got to yeah. play the silliness of it. Um, but that, once I finished that video, I was like, this is so much like what I want to be doing. Like, I want to be able to explore these sort of crazy. I mean, we made mass accessible or at least somewhat understandable <laughs> at least uh my theory now after having played it i actually don't even know if a mouthpiece that was double that way would play a lot different than that one my theory is probably there's like a a, a maximum amount of 
you know, extra sleeve around mm -hmm. it that the map that the energy can get dissipated through before mm -hmm. it becomes totally null. You know, right. if you had a, a huge wall that was made out of brass and there was your mouthpiece carved into it, on the other side of it, you had there was a hole through it, your arm could stick through, and your trumpet was on the other side. I just don't think that the trumpet would sound that different uh, with a way, way heavier mouthpiece. But certainly adding all of that thickness around the mouthpiece all the way around on all sides made a huge difference in how it played. And I felt like I, I, I did my best to show that in the recording. One of the things that's been very uh, surprisingly challenging with these videos is just finding ways to show this information. Like, how can you show that something has different overtones when microphones are constantly adjusting to the natural ambient sound environment. And trumpets are so loud, it's hard to capture them accurately anyway. Um, so I had to start getting creative with, you know, harmonic sensors and overtone readers. Eventually, I'd like to have actual calibrated decibel meters and other kinds of things to make the stuff we do even more uh, precise and scientific so that our um, results can be even more credible, I hope. You know, what we're doing is... It, it's it's basically a pop science in a way. Like it is based on the scientific method, a hundred percent. But mm -hmm. am I accounting for every single variable that I'm aware of? I mean, no. It just it gets out of hand eventually. Yeah. Well, it, it's like MythBusters for trumpet. <laughs> yeah, so definitely. Um, and so I think it has become a, a big stuff. driver. I'm sorry. I so said you just don't blow up enough stuff. If you blow yeah, up right. every once in a while, that yeah. would, I mean that 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 could push you over the top. That that could get you your you know your million views right there coming soon to john talks trumpet um actually i'm actually taking suggestions there's a, a custom job i'm having done that's going to result in a chinese piccolo trumpet that is three valves and has no purpose in my life so i'm taking input on how i should destroy this trumpet or what else i should do with it <laughs> well uh, we, we can maybe have a contest <laughs> That could be a good one. Well, you know, you, as you're talking about uh, uh, Doug and Venture uh, Mouthpieces, um, Doug is a, uh, a sponsor for your channel and a sponsor for my channel as well. Um, and I really love what Doug is doing because it is taking that very uh, scientific approach to things, but he's working to make it accessible to people through through the VenCAD process. And, and you know, you're able to sit there and look and compare and tweak and play around with stuff in a way that that before this we we never had that ability. You know, if you were a, you know a, a craftsman like you're talking about Greg Black, you know, uh, Greg and Peter and guys like that, they they know it up here, but uh, you know they don't all they're not always able to give you the explanation of of the hows and the whys. And VenCAD kind of allows you to dive into the mechanics of the mouthpiece. Uh, making process and to me i find that fascinating i find and i find your partnership to be very very uh well balanced i think it works out really well together um but as you were talking about um you know the, the mouthpieces uh one of the other videos i watched today was uh the one with the uh the lipstick and, <laughs> and the lip intrusion and it was it was fascinating to me and this ties into the venture thing because uh i, I recently started playing venture mouthpieces as well and uh, I went with a much smaller size than I traditionally play. And I always had problems with lip intrusion. And I always thought, well, by getting a, a larger mouthpiece, I'll, I'll be able to compensate for that lip intrusion as opposed to, oh, well, if I get something with a, a slightly sharper alpha angle, angle then, and it could be a smaller diameter, then that's going to prevent me from having that lip intrusion. It's not going to guide me in like that softer slope is going to do. And so that sort of stuff, the, the presentation that you gave, and then like with VenCab, being able to look at it and go, oh, wow, this is, this is what I've been playing on. And this, this is why you can, you can start to, to diagnose why you're having problems with the gear and that new mouthpiece, my articulation, it just, it, it's just super, super crisp. It's super, super accurate. And I'm like, Where's this been all my life? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that Doug is doing is like, I, honestly, it's just what a huge gift for me. Like I had already started the channel um, and I, I remember exactly how this went. Okay. So I released a video about Mouthy's throat and, you know, there's a few little details in that video that I would alter now to make it clearer for people to understand. But um, one of my main points in there is that when you have mouthpieces modified the throat aftermarket, uh, it creates these sharp corners, especially at the bottom of the throat and top of the back bore. And a lot of mouthpiece makers will smooth them out with steel wool, whatever. Of course, you know they're they're incredible machinists. They're going to make it look great, but there's still going to be the the impact of that 
design change on the original backbore length and taper and as well as the entrance to the throat, which are both really important. And so on Facebook, Doug commented on, on one of my posts about it, you know, saying like, hey, my software fixes this. And I, I had been like sort of vaguely aware of Venture because um, Ben Strickland over at Greg Black's shop had mentioned him. And so I started to go over there, looking at his stuff and like looking at his software and what it can do. And he, we, we talked maybe the next day, he gave me like a presentation, uh, me and some of the members of the Astrology Symphony Trumpet section showing me the, the Venkat software and being and comparing stuff in it. Honestly, if it had just been comparison software, I would still be amazed. I mean, it's so much clearer to look at than what I had been using uh, for my whole life, which was the Cancel Comparator. Right, uh, which was an incredible resource for everyone as well, but only had models that Cancel was actually selling, which is one thing. Even though he had many, many copies of many different brands, uh, and also you couldn't like really zoom in, you couldn't really justify things so they were perfectly lined up, so you could compare designs. You just were getting a general picture of the two things right. uh, in a scale that seemed somewhat similar. Um, so if it was just that, my mind would have been blown. But then he started showing me how you could, he was like, that's not even close to all. And started showing me how you could modify the mouthpieces and come up with your own designs and stuff. And then all of the possibilities um, scientifically and research wise just were immediately apparent to me. I was like, I'm sure other mouthpiece manufacturers could have made me two identical mouthpieces with the same throat length, but slightly different board. What I'm sure that was possible before, but it's going to be way easier with this technology, uh, especially with the high level precision that Doug is producing the map. So you mentioned the lipstick test. I want to make sure I say this. So the lipstick test, I actually found this out the other day. I found this really fascinating. I'd heard about it on Trumpet Herald. And for me, it was just like part of the lexicon of things in my mind that I had never tried uh, that I knew would be interesting to do someday. Um, so I was talking to Gary Radke over at GR Mouthpieces, and he told me that originally it was the chapstick test. <laughs> and it was actually, the idea came from, uh, he did a lot of work in machine parts and uh, in that industry for a long time before he started GR Mouthpieces. And in that industry, there is a way that you see how two pieces of metal are contacting each other on a production line that basically like leaves a colored marking on the metal that shows where it's making contact, right? And so that's where he had the idea from, but he was using the chapstick, which works perfectly well because it, it doesn't allow the moisture to bubble up. So you can still definitely see the intrusion with chapstick. But then his, um, his, his guy, Brian Scriver, just came up with the lipstick test, just so much catchier. And the idea of putting lipstick on, on a trumpet player, it's just like, I mean, how could you resist, right? And then, but, but it's not just a silly thing. Like I'm not just putting on lipstick for fun. It's like, as you said, a, a crucial element of mouthpiece design. And how come more people didn't know about it? I don't know, but hopefully a lot more do now. Um, rim engagement and lip engagement into the mouthpiece is one of the things that can mess up players the quickest. I, I'll say before, I started messing with Venture's lead kit. Uh, I have never been able to play a mouthpiece someone recommended to me for lead trumpet, ever. I have an incredible amount of lip intrusion, or a lot, you know, comparatively a lot compared to other people I know, enough that an actually shallow mouthpiece or one with a rim that's going to guide my lips in literally just doesn't work for more than five to 10 seconds, maybe. I don't know. It's not like I can't play the trumpet or play in that register. It's just, you know, it's, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. <laughs> Um, and so for me in the lead kit, the, the solution was the, uh, drop V, which I think is called the LV series. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, immediately it was perfectly fine. <laughs> like it didn't bottom out at all. Yeah. My lips still swell. And I start to ghost nose for that reason, but I'm not hitting the bottom of the mouthpiece anymore. Um, but I thought it was just sort of a shame. Like once I played, I was like, how come that wasn't an option all these other years that I wanted a lead mouthpiece. No one ever told me that there was something that would actually work. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's you know going back to the you know my earlier uh, statement about that is that it just that's one of those things that, that we don't know. I mean, it's just you're you're told shallow mouthpiece or narrow mouthpiece, and that's all. You know, that's what you need for a lead player. Well, no, it's it's the it's the amount of lip intrusion and and some of you know there's so many other variables, and I think that uh, you know while equipment. Yes, practice is always going to be the number one thing, you know, but even with practice, it's not just practicing, it's the correct kind of practice. And it's understanding there's this dynamic balance. If you want to be at the top of the game, you have to have the right practice methods, you have to have the right practice psychology, you have to have the right equipment. Uh, you know, all of those things have to come together because this is a holistic system. And if you you break one part or change one part of that equation, it's going to 
create a trickle down effect in all of the 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 moving parts. So I think that uh, you know what one of the things that we tend to do though is that when we change, when we feel we need to change, we want to make wholesale change as opposed to let's make you know one adjustment or you know finding the crucial elements that need to be adjusted. So <laughs> as you sigh. It's, I mean, this is one of my biggest things because I think there are people, there's a large number of people out there somewhere, some percentage of all trumpet players who have ever tried to play trumpet that quit because they could not get their equipment to work for them. Um, Of course, the better you are at the trumpet and the more you practice and the more familiar you are with the whole thing, making music on the trumpet, the more equipment can do for you, period. You know, so the practice is always going to be that that fundamental layer you know i've never been able to get be able to do something i wasn't able to do at all because i put in a new mouthpiece like just it's not how it works uh the so the systematic changes the small systematic changes i think are are the crucial ones Uh, one of my favorite videos was actually my wife inspired this video she was like what if you framed like all of your times you switch mouthpieces as like relationships and then you you know like what if you were like breaking up with each your mouthpiece and i was like that doesn't even sound like an analogy to me. That sounds real. Like that was what my life was like. I would be in a long-term relationship with a piece of equipment, a trumpet or a mouthpiece and play it for a while. And then you like start to realize there's something about it. You can't quite get past that. That keeps you from wanting to make the extra long-term commitment. Luckily there are no marriage contracts with mouthpieces. So you can kind of change your mind whatever you want. Um, You don't have to like file for a legal divorce from, from your mouthpiece, but the more, the longer that you play the mouthpiece, the more, your trumpet playing is based on that piece of equipment. So when you go in there and you trade out one thing for something completely different, hoping to get a result that you're intending to get, it's probably not going to work. I mean, unless you were so far off base to begin with that a shock to the system is all you needed. Uh, Like if you accidentally had a trombone mouthpiece with a trumpet shank in there all these years, you didn't realize it and you put in a trumpet mouthpiece, that would certainly be a lot easier, (laughs) right? As far as trumpet register. But honestly, I feel like Most mouthpiece manufacturers now have such a wide range of available mouthpieces that you can find something you you that'll work for you in almost any brand. But what's difficult is finding out the details that you need to know to actually make that decision. Um, Venture made that really easy for me, and then it happens they also make incredible mouthpieces quickly and with high precision. So for me, it was really natural. Um, But you know, I definitely. I, I I really urge people to think carefully before switching equipment. I know my channel's you know full of like what about this? What about this? What about that? But in my personal life, I have played basically the same exact mouthpiece design and same trumpets for at least five years, five years. And even the venture mouthpiece I play now is just a small adjustment away from what I was playing before because I make my living playing the trumpet. Uh, it's really important to me to have a high level of consistency. And if I start throwing in just random variables, then that, they can make trumpet playing harder. And it yeah. does for many people. Yeah. Well, and, and speaking of your trumpet playing, um, you know, working with the, the, uh, the Charlotte Symphony, um, I know that like so many other uh, players that, uh, you know, there was a little, little hiccup with, with COVID uh, and, and now things are opening up back up again. Um, How's it feel to to be back on the on the hustle and grind? It, it feels really good, man. I got to tell you. Um, you know, you spent so long playing trumpet and performing trumpet, and you take it all for granted. It just feels like it's going to be there. You know, uh, I had always prepared myself psychologically for injuries. I'm kind of an anxious person, so I'm always like imagining I'm in the car, and I'm like, what if I stop too suddenly and hit my face on the steering wheel, and I puncture my lip with my teeth? Oh, sorry for that vivid image, everybody. But it. You know, I I do think about that stuff sometimes or frequently enough that it bothers me. But (laughs) when COVID hit, it was like, oh, my God, this was completely out of my imagination and everyone else's. And it's preventing all of us from being together and making music. And honestly, as an orchestra musician, my specialty is playing in a group. So, of course, I can always make videos of me playing by myself. And that feels nice. It feels good to play. But my specialty, my energy, my passion is mostly in coordinating i feel like a traffic cop sometimes in the middle of a press section like I, i'm just trying i'm taking in all these different inputs and trying my best to massage them nuance them into so we're all sort of together you know and so for me playing by myself it's just 
doesn't feel as natural. And so for the last year and a half, I've had a few opportunities to play with my colleagues and, you know, brass quintets and that kind of thing distance. But, you know, so many of the skills that I developed were suddenly just not uh, useful for a little bit. Like I just couldn't, or they had to be turned on overdrive. Like if I wanted to actually match someone, I had to like turn my ears huge. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I studied with um, the incredible Charlie Geyer. And one of his, one of the things that sticks with me the most that I repeat the most frequently is, you know, as a second trumpet player, it's like your Dumbo, the elephant from the, from the movie. And you have these huge ears and you're flopping your Dumbo ear on the other person's trumpet bell. And you're just like completely focused on the person next to you. Uh, he even recommends scooting about six inches forward. I've had principal players that are a little bit bothered by that, but if if I, if I do it, and they don't notice. I'll just stay there, and it makes because it makes it so much easier for me to hear that player because mm -hmm. it's so projectional or projection oriented, I guess. Right. Um, and so getting a little bit in front of them made a big difference. So uh, all this is to say that getting back to it, I mean, it's it's still a little, we're still a bit on the on ramp right now, but we're about to be full blast this weekend. I'm playing, you know, a a, a pop show with a soul band and i've got all you know actually 42 pages of music the violinists all laughed at me when i made that joke but <laughs> 42 pages of music is more than i've had to learn in a long time so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that show this weekend um but you know then after that beethoven four you know some concerto and it back to the uh very diverse musical experiences i i'm used to having uh, yeah. while i'm while i'm working professionally Wow, that's that's great. Uh, yeah, and you you've mentioned two great teachers, you know, uh, uh, Charlie and uh, and Dave Hickman. Um, I think two of the most respected uh, teachers in the business right now. Um, so, what are, are some of the, the big influences uh, that those two guys have had on you as a as a professional? You know, I'm going to take your question. I'm going to blow it up just slightly more. I'm going to say at least one or two things I loved about each teacher I had. Okay. Cause I, I can't remember once I was talking to, I think it was professor Butler and she was like, you know, I feel like people should acknowledge their first teachers more. And I was like, you're so right. I had an amazing first teacher. My, my first teacher, his name was Stuart King. He was a, actually a jazz guy. We're friends on Facebook. He likes my posts and stuff. I, we haven't talked in a while. I would love to reconnect with him, but honestly, he set me up so, so well, like from before sixth grade, I hadn't been in band at all took two weeks of, you know, the camp thing that he was teaching at. And then my parents uh, had me do private lessons from then to the beginning of the school year. But by the time the school year started, and I started sixth grade, uh, we had already played chromatic scale through the range that I could play, you know, C, E, G on top of the staff or something. And like, uh, he taught me like accidentals. We've been playing Arbin's duets every week. And I mean, those are the two most important things, like knowing what the notes are and playing with people. I mean, <laughs> you know, so he, he really set me off on the right track and it made everything so much easier after that. Um, so after that, I had, when I moved to Alaska, I had a teacher, Carrie Mall, that I studied with for seven years, the whole, or six years, the whole time I lived in Alaska, I, I was studying with him. And he was the third trumpet of the Anchorage Symphony, but also had been brought there initially by his work with the, I believe it was the U.S. Air Force Jazz Band. Um, and he'd been stationed in Alaska. And <laughs> incredible. I mean, he has like a Dixie group and, you know, albums and stuff. I mean, actually I met him through a jazz improv clinic that my dad signed up for, signed up, signed me up for my first summer in Alaska as a seventh grader. And anyway, what a cool guy. We, we covered so much rep, so much orchestra playing, you know, he was the coach for the youth orchestra as well. Um, the, the director of the youth orchestra, Lynn Wieda, was the principal trumpet of the Anchorage Symphony and another major influence on me. He studied with Roger Voisin and Armando Gatala at Boston University. Like, my youth orchestra director in Anchorage, Alaska, studied with these guys. Like, how lucky could I possibly be? Um, and he also helped me out when I was preparing for college. I studied with Dave Hickman. Oh, my God. That was such a incredible and intense experience, not only trumpet playing wise, but academically. Something that Dave did that I'm actually not sure, Professor Hickman, I'm sorry, that he did that I'm not sure that I've seen at other universities yet. Many universities have extra class, but what he does, what he does is each student has one lesson a week, it's a regular private lesson. And then each student also has a second lesson that is a group lesson with three or four fixed people throughout the whole year. And every week you're preparing an entire orchestra piece all the parts and then he drills all of you on them on rotation for an entire hour like making sure that all of you know all of the excerpts and it wasn't just um like regular orchestra audition excerpts either it was actually like all encompassing it was every orchestra 
trumpet thing that was hard or like technical stuff that doesn't show up on auditions, but things you would still want to know if you ever came across it on the job. And to this day, I come across stuff that I've only done in his excerpt class and it saves my butt every single time, <laughs> because if I actually had to go home and study it, it would take me too long. You know, right. just we go through repertoire too quickly. Um, and then the research stuff that I was telling you about earlier, I mean, that had a huge impact on me. I was so used to just internalizing random things that I read on the internet and thinking of them as part of my knowledge base. And I hadn't, I mean, I was always, you know, trying to dig down to the truth, but with trumpet, it was a little hard. Like there's so many, um, most of the information out, out there about mouthpieces and equipment come from manufacturers. So a lot of what they say is incredibly precise and accurate, but also it always has that marketing flair too. So right. sometimes it can be hard to divide like the flair that they need to sell a mouthpiece from the actual mouthpiece itself. Like what are the characteristics of it and is it going to solve your problem? Right. Um, and that was such a big challenge that I think, you know, proper research, like what is expected of doctoral students is probably the only way to do it. And I'm also discovering a lot of people have written dissertations on mouthpiece related subjects. Matt Frost, I think, wrote like, I can't remember if it was 80, 100 pages, maybe more. Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, only about backboard designs. Like that's his dissertation, Matt Frost. This, I mean, incredible. Uh, I can't wait to like be even more familiar with all this stuff so that I can actually read into those dissertations a lot and, and try to pull things out of them that I could, you know, help show the world. Um, but so Dave Hickman, I mean, yeah, huge, huge influence. He's also a big, um, he has a huge emphasis on style, uh, which is something I think a lot of trumpet players don't necessarily focus on when they're trying to get good at classical trumpet, because there's so many just skills involved. It's like, oh, well, you got to have a perfect, you know, a very clear sound, you know, beautiful phrasing, multiple tonguing technique, high range, low range, all this other stuff. And then the actually learning musical styles part doesn't necessarily get emphasized. Um, and also trumpet has music that's only for kind of a narrow range of dates compared to a lot of instruments. So we don't even necessarily have exposure through just playing in our high school bands and orchestras to music that is, you know, outside of uh, what most trumpet players are being asked to play. Um, so something like the Haydn Trumpet Concerto, for example, Professor Hickman has an incredible edition of this piece that if you buy it, you'll know exactly what was in the original Haydn part. And you'll know exactly which are his editor's recommended notes because they're bracketed, right? Mm -hmm. I, I just, <laughs> I, I love that. Like that attention to detail, I, I want, I aspire to that uh, in everything that I do for the channel. Um, I also, when I was at ASU, I studied with a, a player in the Phoenix Symphony, the associate principal, Benny Nguyen. I studied with him a lot. Uh, and he helped me especially prepare for graduate school auditions, but he was like my even though I did so much orchestral stuff at school with, with Professor Hickman, he was like my orchestral extra guru, you know, like with Professor Hickman, we had to cover so many things. It's not like we could spend weeks, months only working on the few excerpts that I really needed uh, to get into graduate school or, or whatever. So with, I did all of that with, with Benny in addition and having these two different personalities impacting me at the same time. Oh man. I, he, so Benny comes from a background of, he's been with the Phoenix Symphony for a long time, but he also played several seasons at the Chicago Symphony. Uh, when he, before he was in Phoenix, he studied with Jacobs, Chickwitz. Uh, he also studied with Schluter. He also studied with Boyd Hood at USC. I mean, he's got an incredible line of pedagogues behind him. And so when I was studying with him, he, all of these new things were suddenly becoming familiar to me, like stamp and, and uh, other types of trumpet pedagogy that I hadn't really been exposed to yet. Um, that much. I'd heard about it, Trumpet Herald, heard about it, Trumpet Pedagogy class, dug in a little bit, but really got to dig in and practice those things with that teacher. He was a very patient mentor, always like, I reach out for questions all the time, probably way too frequently. Like now, if I had a student that texted me as frequently as I did, I'd be like, please stop, please stop. <laughs> but, he, but he always had an answer and he always was willing to help. And um, yeah, he, just that level of mentorship. I mean, I, I aspire to be that for my students, you know, best I can. Um, when I went to graduate school, I got to study with the incredible, uh, professor Charlie Geyer, as well as I had a lot of contact with professor Barbara Butler as well, but it's something a lot of people don't necessarily know is that at Rice anyway, it's two studios. I mean, you study with two different, it's, I was in Charlie's studio. I was his TA actually. And so almost all of my lessons and interactions that were private were primarily with him. But of course, Professor Butler was always around hearing me in studio class. They, they both came to all the orchestra rehearsals. They're both very keyed in on all of the students. 
Um, but when I got to graduate school, I suffered from, I feel, very low self-esteem. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why. I think it's just my disposition. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, my trumpet playing was always fine, but I think that my self-esteem many times gave me a lot of extra anxiety that made it difficult. Um, and so my biggest concern when I got to Rice was not really so much on my playing, although, of course, I knew there were so many things I needed to improve at. But my psychological game was just not good. It was... Um, you know, I'd approach performances with so much hesitation. I'd be, you know, maybe I didn't, uh, I, I don't always have the best discipline when it comes to practicing specific things that are coming up or whatever. Sometimes I come into a lesson and be like, oh, this audition is in X days. How do I get myself out of the situation? Right. And he was never judgmental about it. He would never be like, you know, come on you know, why didn't you start before now? Because I'd heard that a hundred times in my life. That wasn't going to necessarily help me at that moment. I wanted to know how to do better at this thing in a few days. And he was like, here's what you do today. Here's what you do tomorrow. Here's what you do the next day. And he would just have this way of making me feel like I had everything I needed, that I'd already done everything I needed to do, and that the challenge was not even a big deal. And I don't know, it just, it, and it was, that was just one way he dealt with it. I mean, I, I think of my two years studying with him as like very intense trumpet therapy. You know, certainly I played in lessons for him many times, but I think the, the thing that made me change the most was the impact he had on my uh, thought process and just ability to approach things with calmness and clarity. Yeah, well, that's that's so important. You know, it it um, I think that's one of the things that that got me down the path that I've been on for the latter part of my life uh, has, was related to, it was performance anxiety as a, as a trumpet player. And you know, I was like, I felt great playing in an ensemble. I felt horrible playing as a soloist and, uh, you know, trying to figure out what it was and why it was and, and working through that. So yeah, the, the, that's, like I said earlier, the psychological game is such a, such a crucial component to our ability to, to really do our best on the instrument because if there's if there's fear anxiety things like that then there's no joy to your music and if there's no joy then you're not going to practice you're not going to do the things that you need to do <laughs> you're not going to be able to endure the stuff that you have to go through but because there, there's there's no drive let me um, touch on a common misconception um so with performance anxiety and i, I you know, I'd love to hear your take on this as well. One of the research papers I wrote for Professor Hickman was about propranolol beta blockers and how they were, you know, the original research that was done on them with musicians by Charles Brannigan, I think in the 70s. He's a tubist that plays the Denver Brass. He's still he's still around. It's awesome. Um, and I learned from that, but also just through my life experience, I was lucky enough to know about propranolol around the time I took my first professional audition, which was when I was a senior in undergrad. So I've never taken a professional audition without it. Does that kind of solve everything? Absolutely not. Not even close. The only thing that Prenol or other beta blockers will probably help you with, or at least in my experience, is just the physical tremors. Like you just are not as likely to physically shake. But your brain, if it's going a million miles an hour, it's not going to slow down. Mine never does. Like during a performance, that's my biggest battle. It's not the physical tremors because of Prenol, but it's because of just psychological distractions, uh, mm -hmm. staying complete. And also when you're performing music, you're taking in a ton of different input all at the same time. You're physically operating the instrument. You're literally reading and translating music in your mind before you do so. And then you're also taking in the 70 or 80 other people who are on stage that are that you can hear that you're trying to play with. I mean, that's already enough things to think about without having like little internal battles happening about how you're going to manage some future playing challenge in that performance. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there for panel. I mean, definitely look into it. If you're somebody who suffers from physical tremors, talk to your doctor as always. Uh, but it's, it, this is not a, an actual solution for performance anxiety. It goes so much deeper than that. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, and, and this is, uh, you know, kind of off topic in a way, but not really. Um, always one of my beefs with Western medicine is our, our propensity for uh, treating the symptom and not really identifying the cause, which actually relates to like, you know, equipment and things like that. It's like, you know, let's, let's understand what the, what are the underlying factors that are creating this uh, as opposed to, you know, okay, well, you've got tremors, all right, that take this and then it'll get rid of it. Um, yeah. I, I think with the, um, 
there's there's like the the idea that you're you're really only able to focus on one your your brain is only able to focus on one thing at a time and fun uh, funny enough uh, today as i was driving in uh to my studio i was listening to a podcast where someone was talking about focus and how we have the misconception uh about focus as being you know this very long uh intense you know you're only thinking about one thing for this this length of time and he's talking about how um you know focus is an individual process for each of us and you know we often think like if you if you've been diagnosed with add or adhd how that you know that shows up as a lack of focus it's like no you know you're you're just hyper focused but you're hyper focused for a short period of time and so you're actually able to focus on more things than someone who has the traditional uh definition of focus and attention and so it's understanding your unique processes and and how that works so you know my mind you know is, is also that way where i'm i'm always thinking about different things you know because that's and that's the world that we live in there's so many things that are going on it's and certainly it's, encouraged by culture yeah oh yeah absolutely and, and we're taking in all of these uh all of the sensory input and we have to be able to then process it and package it and do something with it so um i i'd like the concept of um uh, of taking things and and packaging them basically of of um uh, of making them uh, a unique kind of bound thing. Uh, you take multiple things and you you make them one singular concept. So like for trumpet playing, you could break down everything into individual aspects, physical aspects, mental aspects, you know, musical aspects, things like that. Or you get to a point where it becomes one thing. It becomes batched. So totally. to play, you know, to play a note is just okay. I want to play a C. Or then you become, as you get uh, more uh, used to this concept, it's like to play the Haydn or the Hummel or, or Mahler or anything. It's like, oh, this is what it is. So you're not thinking about the indiv individual components. It's like that is the individual component. That is the thing. And then you just, you think, okay, play Mahler. Boom. And it comes out. Yeah, it really, I mean, this does go back to a lot of the stuff that I remember learning when I was working with Benny with, he had so many experiences working personally with Jacobs. And so I started reading way more about Arnold Jacobs and trying to get an idea of what this was about. Of course, you read Song and Wind by Brian Fredrickson. That's great. Get a lot of context on his life and, and teachings and stuff. Another book I really recommend for trumpet players out there, uh, Lasting Change for Trumpeters by Louise Lubriel is a translation of all of these concepts for trumpet by somebody who studied with jacobs and i think the back like quarter of the book is just literally transcribed interviews with jacobs and other people it's or people and people who studied with jacobs and about his teaching concepts it's uh, i bring it to all my auditions i'll just flip through it you know while i'm preparing because the the core concepts in there in the middle of the lasting change you get all these crazy technical diagrams like jacobs was very into understanding the root causes of, of physiological issues while playing but as a teacher he knew it was important to know those things and to sometimes give the student a glimpse of those but he would give them some nice packaged concept that did just as well like he would say things sorry he had so much practice at delivering that information um at least that's what I understand. So it, it really, it comes down to like, one of the easily, most easily memorable examples for me is, um, oh, go pick up that chair. You stand up and you go grab the chair and you bring it over here. You didn't think, okay, activate toes to balance. Now I'm going to use my thighs to help propel myself out of the chair to stand up. And then I'm going to use my feet like this. With, you know, I'm going to go left one first and then the right one. And then I'm going to reach out my left hand and I'm going to slowly curl the pinky of my left hand and then the ring finger. And then, the, no, of course not. Of course, you're not doing that. Those are the individual actions that all occur as part of the package in your mind of literally um, manifesting, moving the chair. <laughs> so over time with trumpet or with anything else, that information does get packaged and batched in a really nice, convenient way. And it makes it much easier to stay focused for me. Like the way I, the primary way I, I prepare for auditions now, it's not like the, the excerpts change. They don't really. You know, maybe the list changes a little bit. Maybe once in a while I'll see a few new ones, but really it's sort of all the same stuff. And so the primary way that I'll prepare is by cutting out recordings 
from a full length recording of just the excerpt plus like maybe four measures before it or whatever the relevant portion right before it for tempo is. Mm -hmm. And I'll just play it on repeat in random order in the car while I'm preparing for the audition for a few weeks. And within a day or two, I'm like jamming, jiving, conducting, singing in the car on the way to work to my trumpet excerpts. Not because I love to study. I don't like to study, but trumpet excerpts are some of the best music for the trumpet in orchestra. So that's the way that I found that engaged my mind to study those excerpts. And it gave me, it gives me a huge benefit that I always know what the tempo is going to be. I always know how it's supposed to sound before I start. It makes me so much less focused on physically what's happening. It's like, I know I have the skills I need to pull off the excerpt. So what's going to help me put all those things together? An extremely clear picture of how you want it to sound. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That is absolutely great. And man, that, that alone is worth the price of admission folks right there. Um, I do, I do need to ask you this question. You, you earlier had, um, uh, I mentioned your wife and, um, I just have to ask you this. How in the hell does she put up with you? I mean, is she... <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 All right. So here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So we met when I was a freshman in college. Uh, I am not that different now than I was then. I'm sure, I, I hope I'm more socially capable than I was. But otherwise, I mean, so we first started hanging out because we ran a, a music history class together called uh, Music as Culture, which was actually like an ethnomusicology class mm -hmm. for freshmen. And so we had to study like and perform like gamelan and stuff for this class. So there was a lot of like extra studying and stuff that needed to happen. Um, and so... You know, I actually recognized her because we went to Interlock and Arts Camp together, but we never talked there. Never. Like, I just, she was a person I knew existed because she played saxophone in, in that program. Uh, and then when I saw her at school at ASU, I was like, great, somebody I recognize. I'll go up and say hi. <laughs> right? And so we started talking. We started hanging out. We started studying for this class together. And I think, like, the first night we had a real serious study session. I, you know, we were there until, like, one or two in the morning because the conversation had just been so engaging. I think we'd also gotten the work done, which is thanks to her because she's an excellent, excellent student. But um, I think, if I dare to say, Courtney, <laughs> it was it might have been one of the things that she liked <laughs> was that I was just so passionate and into it. And so, you know, here I am today. I'm not that different. How does she put up with me on a daily basis now? Well, for the first year of John Talks Trumpet from August 2020 until, I guess, July, 2021, Courtney and I were, you know, in the house together. She was teaching band remotely, and I was not really at work, but I was also at work a lot doing other roles as stage crew, working with video and cameras and microphones and that kind of stuff. Um, so we were definitely co-producers of all the videos. She was sitting behind the camera, and almost all of my early videos, she's saying the line or or the part of the phrase right before I say it. And then I just cut out all the parts where she talked because my I just could not, it, without a script or something right in front of me, delivering the technical information was too difficult and I wanted it to be right. So that's how we did it. Um, so that shows how much commitment she has to the channel. Um, and I'm so proud of her now. She is doing a master's in business at Duke, which is in Durham, which is about two and a half hours from here. Um, so I go visit whenever I can. She comes here and visits whenever she can. Uh, I think it's been really good for me to learn how to run the whole thing on my own. She's happy to give input whenever. I'd say the biggest challenge for me writing the videos is that I really struggle with being concise because I could think of a hundred ways to relate a subject. And so I could write about one subject and have it be too, way too many pages or just too much extra information. Um, and so she is my primary script editor. <laughs> she has a much better idea of like how to be engaging throughout something than I initially did because she's so much better at writing papers than I was. Um, I had gotten really good at research papers, but that's not exactly like written to be engaging. Those are written to be very precise. Mm -hmm. um, so the balance of those two things, I mean, so she was heavily, heavily involved with the channel at the beginning, of course, still now as an emotional support <laughs> for me. Um, I'm just so proud of what she's doing over there. I, I think it's it's awesome that she's going into business and everything she tells me about business is helpful for what I'm doing anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's been great it's been a change but it's it's been awesome for us and i can't wait until you know she's done and we and she can come back and we can uh go back to not only living together but also working on all this stuff together and both being passionate and engaged in our jobs yeah 
Well, it sounds like you, you guys have a, a really good uh, dynamic balance of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the passionate, free-flowing John <laughs> and the, the little more concise and, and grounded Courtney. So uh, She keeps me on track. I mean, I think w- without her, the one video a week that I was doing for the first few months would have just never been possible um because she was really she was putting in hours like we were both putting in hours editing videos writing scripts and stuff it was crazy and she's like i don't even play trumpet and now i know way too much about mouthpiece throats <laughs> and i'm like i'm so sorry you know and, except well okay one benefit that she'll admit is when i'm having a conversation with other trumpet players and she's there she's she was always on it but now she's way more on it <laughs> she's like uh, yeah um probably a saxophonist that knows far too much about trumpet mouthpieces but yeah well everybody should know about trumpet mouthpieces as yeah. far as i'm concerned yeah. everybody cares right yeah, exactly. It should be a, a Jeopardy category. <laughs> well, uh, my friend, uh, we are going to uh, get to a couple of our standard segments. Uh, the first of which is called Sound Off. It's brought to us by our good friend and sponsor, Michael Barkley of Barkley Microphones. And Sound Off is um, about our concepts of sound. And uh, as you are definitely an equipment guru, um, Let's talk about uh, your personal approach to sound and sound production, uh, particularly from that of an orchestral player. Um, And what advice would you give uh, a young and upcoming player uh, or just even, you know, a professional player who's looking to make improvements in the quality of their sound? What are some of the things that they could look at, uh, particularly from an an equipment standpoint, which we'll talk more equipment later? Sure. So one of the things that strikes me the most is that people – don't think that much or don't always think about which trumpet player are they hearing the most themselves by a lot, by a huge amount. Most people um, they're hearing themselves from behind the bell through the cone, the bone conduction in their skull. Like it's not even necessarily that good representation of how you yourself sound, you know, the, the impression we have of ourselves. Um, and so that became really apparent to me when I f- took my first lesson with professor Butler, which I took before I actually was at rice. And she was, she said many things, that groundbreaking, uh, unbelievable, helpful things that she taught me. But one of them was, honestly, if you want to improve your sound, you have to just find a sound model that you love and listen to it nonstop. <laughs> like, wait, like walking to and from your car, in the car, when you're walking between classes, when you're just sitting around, like make it a habit to listen to the players that sound the way you want to sound. That's really the only way. Um, cause if you can't recreate something you haven't heard, you could do it accidentally, but you would never notice it and hone in on it if you did. Um, so having an extremely, extremely strong influence from a few players can make a huge difference for me at that time. Uh, I started listening to Bob Sullivan, uh, who I wasn't super familiar with yet, but he has several amazing trumpet albums, former member of the New York Philharmonic and Cleveland Orchestra, now the principal trumpet of the Cincinnati Symphony. And he has one of the most gorgeous sounds I've ever heard. I mean, it's not just how he plays his actual sound, the vibrations of his lips, but also like his how he engages his vibrato and phrasing. And uh, oh my God, I was just in love when I first heard it. And so I was like, fine, I'll just listen to a ton of Bob Solomon. I had both of his albums and on a big playlist on repeat. Uh, another one was James Markey. Yeah, bass trombonist. I know, right? But he has such a beautiful way of playing. And he has two albums, at least at the time when I was listening. Uh, on bass, which is his bass trombone album. And I think it's Off-Roads is his tenor trombone album. Both are next level musicianship, extremely high level musicianship. And that's what I felt like I needed more of. It wasn't just their incredible sounds that are obviously suited for orchestra players since they are them, but also their very authentic and um, beautiful approach to music making. Yeah. And flooding their brains with my, uh, bl- sorry, flooding my brain with their sounds made differences that I could have never practiced. I could have never sat in a practice room and and had a note that said sound more like James Markey and accomplished anything. Like only listening to them over and over, it, it felt like eventually I couldn't even start my playing day without listening to something from from one of those people. Of course, also you throw in Phil Smith, you throw in Tom Hooten, you throw in Chris Martin, you throw in these other incredible uh, orchestral players that are out there today. And it was like, I had more sound concepts that I even knew what to do with, but certainly they all had an impact on how I played. And it was just the direct, I heard it. And so when I go to play, it's hard to get it out of my mind. It's like, it's an earworm. It's just stuck in there. Yeah. Well, cool. Cool. Very good. 
I like that. So uh, let's uh, move on to uh, our next segment, and that is brought to us by our mutual friend, Doug McVeigh of Venture Mouthpieces. This is our geared up segment uh, and brought to us by Venture, where technology, design, and craftsmanship intersect like that. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about your gear, your gear, not just your gear, because I know that would be like another three hours of <laughs> just before we got off your B flats and mouthpieces. Yeah. Uh, but your concepts of gear for the uninitiated or those uh, who are looking for ways to approach their, their gear. And, uh, you know, if you're looking to change, what would you want to think about maybe starting with first? Okay. So as far as my gear, I have, I would say like eight or nine trumpets that are sort of my regular, you know, things I might take to work. Guess what? They're all different keys and different uses though. I don't have more than one B flat trumpet actually. Um, I just have my Yamaha. Uh, so I'll just go, go down the list real quick and then we'll talk about the equipment um, generally. Uh, I have a Yamaha Chicago second generation B flat trumpet with a third generation tuning slide on it and a pitch finder by Charlie Milk, vented valve by Charlie Milk, extra slide stop by Charlie Milk. Great trumpet, love it. Um, they have a Mark III of those now, but I haven't had a chance to try one yet. Uh, my C trumpet is a Yamaha Chicago Generation 2 C trumpet with a Generation 3 tuning slide uh, with a pitch finder by Charlie Malik. Yeah, 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 same thing. It's, it's a very similar setup because I like it to be consistent. Uh, my E flat is a Yamaha 9636 E flat, which is a long bell um, E flat trumpet that has a bell that is extremely similar, again, to the Yamaha Chicago. And it's meant to be very, very consistent so that when you're in an audition set setting, pick up one trumpet, pick up the other. They're in different keys, but they feel, feel as similar as you can get them to be. Um, I have a Yamaha GF trumpet that I really, really like, a 9710 as a tunable bell model. I use that a lot at weddings, especially the G trumpet side. It's like having a really, really extra awesome piccolo trumpet that it feels like to me. Um, I even play that when I'm playing second piccolo in the orchestra sometimes. Like if we're playing Messiah or something, I'll bring the G trumpet instead of a piccolo because it just has a slightly beefier sound, easier to tune in those registers, whatever. Uh, my piccolo is a Yamaha 9830 custom piccolo trumpet that I bought from my old teacher, Benny. I think it's from the 90s. Um, and it's just the four valve thing. It's got a trigger, a uh, first valve trigger by Scott Sweeney. Love to play in tune. Thanks, Charlie Geyer. Uh, third valve ring and slide stop and vented valve. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Check out my channel if you're wondering about some of those things. I could love detail about those. Um, I have a flugelhorn, a Yamaha 731, holla Ch Chuck Mangione. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't use it that frequently, but we do, you know, when it comes up in orchestra, we need to have one. So I've got one. Um, let's see. Oh yeah. My rotary C trumpet is a Vimon passion C rotary that I bought a few years ago. I have an extra tuning slide with no vent holes on it. Cause I like to reduce weight, makes it a little bit more responsive. I'm playing low register anyway. So it's hard. I don't like it to be tubby. Um, let's see. I wonder how many I got through there. Plenty. I have a Shilke E3L as well. I have another E flat trumpet with a beryllium bell. Oh. It's like an extra, extra light copper bell. I, it's from the era where there might actually be a little bit of beryllium in that, which is one of the lightest metals on the periodic table. But uh, it's it's just got the super spicy sound. I haven't had a chance to use it really much yet, but I love it. I love it. Um, and I have a Besson B-flat A trumpet that is about 100 years old. I think some modifications done to it. Keep your eyes out for that. Um, it's going to be awesome. Can't wait to see it. It has a quick change B-flat to A rotor valve, which was actually pretty common 100 years ago. Um, the mouthpiece situation has gotten a lot simpler since I started working with Doug. I, I don't, you know, actually, I don't, I've only been using, I think we've made maybe four mouthpieces for me that are things that go on my main trumpets that I bring to work so far. But, you know, it's all along, my goal was just to get basically the same rim on different underpart designs that would fit each trumpet playing characteristics that I wanted, I guess. Um, as far as equipment generally, though, I think it's, it's very tempting to get into the um, – it's sort of like the NFL where, like, people have their team and they get, like, really attached to their team and they're like, yay, you know, go Ravens or whatever it is. I'm <laughs> not much of a sports guy myself, you know, go sports ball. And I watch the Super Bowl with my parents, you know, each year, but they right. go to a party or two. But I'm not, like, super into sports. But, you know, most people, they're like, oh, my first trumpet was this, and then they end up getting kind of stuck over there and just sort of assuming that that camp is the place to stay. There's nothing wrong with that. The longer that you play equipment, the better you're going to get at operating it. 
no matter what it is, as long as it's functional. Okay. If something's wrong with it or like, you know, have your, if you have a private teacher, always have them try your trumpet once in a while, make sure everything's working properly. Uh, sometimes I've had students that just sound bad for a month or two and it's kind of unusual. And I'm like, and they don't know what's going on and neither do I. And eventually I pick up the trumpet and their, their valve is half turned or something, you know, it's, you just gotta, or maybe there's something stuck in it <laughs> that happens too. <laughs> you know, that's, it, it's silly, but it happens even all the way up through college. There was one time, I don't know if you guys know those Hercules trumpet stands with the yellow ball on it. Oh, uh, yeah. I was watching a performance once at Rice where somebody was using an E flat trumpet, a Shoka E3 all on that. And they had to pick it up to play and it wouldn't like the yellow ball got stuck inside the bell and could not be removed during the performance. So the person had to just sight read the part on something else. <laughs> I'm just uh, like, uh, oh, God. okay. So that's, that was painful for me, for me to watch certainly, but um, generally, you know, when it comes to actually changing equipment, yeah, I feel like it should almost be a necessity by the time you actually decide to change something. It should not just be because you feel like upgrading to motivate yourself. Like, yeah, we all think that buying a new trumpet or a new mouthpiece is going to motivate us into practicing more and sounding better. At least it's part of the psychology of buying new equipment, but it's just not how it works. You have to imagine it's more like I have a huge workbench and I need 500 times types of hammers. And they're all slightly different, and they're going to be sli used for slightly different situations. Um, the changes that we want to make to equipment, by the time we actually realize we need them, should be as small as possible. Even something like, let's say you play a Bach 37 Stradivarius or something, and you've been playing it for five years, and you like it, and it's the only professional trumpet you've ever had. But you're like, mm, what if there's something a little bit, you know, it feels like it's a little bit one thing or another. You can try something as simple as like, twisting the screw on your water key and that can change playing characteristics a little bit you can go a little bigger you can trade out a tuning slide literally the same one you could get another 37 tuning slide to switch it out and it would feel different i promise like just it, it's bizarre you don't even have to get something that's actually different uh, in design um and then of course you could actually go different designs if you wanted this is where i start it starts getting to weird territory for me if you're going to modify a trumpet beyond uh to the point where it's not really stock anymore it's always going to be really hard to have context for that. Like you can read online that, you know, this aftermarket lead pipe is going to make you sound darker, brighter, whatever, but you're not going to know until it's installed. And then when it's installed, it's too late. Like you can't install the original one again and have it be identical and you can't compare them A to B. And then if you ever do resell that trumpet, other people are not going to know how it plays because it's customized. <laughs> so I don't know. It gets a little bit tricky. I, I, I think people should, you know, I think people often get to that solution a little quicker than they should. You know, start small, start small. We're, we're working with extremely small tolerances here. Trumpet lips, the lips are meat reads. You know, we play on these tiny little mouthpieces with tiny, tiny amounts of cup depth, especially when you start playing lead trumpet mouthpieces and stuff. And every little change is going to make a noticeable difference. So changing stuff out wholesale is always as, as more of a risk than a benefit. Sometimes you learn something from disrupting the system that way. Certainly I did. I mean, go watch my mouthpiece breakups video. I've played some weird mouthpieces, things I would never go back to now. I learned things from them, definitely. But it didn't help me get better as a player necessarily because I spent time on weird stuff, not developing my chops on things that I would eventually use as conventional equipment. Um, don't be afraid to use conventional equipment. Uh, they're conventional because they are sort of statistically the most common, which is helpful in some situations. People wonder why orchestral players are so focused on just a few brands of trumpets. And the reason is that most people who play in orchestras are playing those trumpets. It's extremely circular. And I'm not saying that's inherently good or bad, but if you want to be an orchestra player and you want an orchestra player who's listening to you to be like, that sound is recognizable to me, it's going to be easier if you're within the few brands and sort of the, the structure of you know, the kinds of equipment that they're already using. For for jazz, uh, honestly, you know, it depends. I imagine it depends on what you're doing, but I always feel like the more solo you are, the more unique your sound can be and just feel totally free to have the voice you want to have. You know, if you're playing in a four-person big band section, I know those guys play different equipment from each other because they have different roles, uh, but th their ultimate goal is just a section blend, you know, uh, and <laughs> they're incredible at it, you know, even when they're not playing exact same trumpets. For for me in the orchestra, I've noticed that blending is... A, is uh, my job as blending is so much easier if the section is playing really similar equipment. You know, of course you want people to have the right to experiment, whatever, but as 
uh, interpreters of orchestral music, and we have to have three trumpets playing very similarly and matching as quickly as possible. Having similar equipment makes a lot of sense. Um, that said, there are so many brands out there because there's literally something for everyone. Uh, even though we talk so much science with equipment, it is art. It's all art. The trumpets are art. The mouthpieces are art. The music obviously is art. And so it, at the end of the day, you really just want to develop your close relationship with the equipment you have. And if you want to make some changes that will make something possible, like please experiment carefully and slowly. Um, and, you know, try to find out what you can about mouthpieces before doing it. It's a really expensive thing to do, uh, to just buy mouthpieces just to try them. You're paying full price for a mouthpiece. You don't even know if you can play for five minutes. <laughs> like, what if movies were like that? You, like, pay admission, and then you walk in, and you don't know if you can stand to watch it for more than a few minutes. <laughs> like, you would never make that bet on something that's 150, 150 bucks. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that, People should feel free to learn as much as they possibly can about equipment. But remember, it's really just about you and your relationship to the instrument. Like develop the sound you want to develop best you can on the equipment you have. And you'll eventually find yourself hitting limits that are not possible to pass. Uh, for example, like let's say this happened to me when I was in graduate school. I, I, at Rice, there was an incredible community culture where other trumpet players would just stop in. And I liked it because they would be interrupting my practice session. And I was like, great, I can talk now. This is awesome. Yeah, I can talk to them about stuff. And there was one time I had like four or five different trumpet players grilling me at once, trying to get me to play as loud as I could. And I was having trouble playing louder than they, they, they wanted me to keep going louder. And I was maxed out. And it took me a while to realize. I was like, oh, I'm playing on a 26 throat mouthpiece. Huh. Literally physically less air is going through it. Uh, what happens if I try something with a bigger hole on it? You know, there you go. That fixed it. Like I was able to play slightly louder while having that same brilliant trumpet sound and have even more velvety softs. I mean, that was, if I didn't know that, I would just internalize that I could not play loudly and then start discount, you know, people end up like that. And sometimes limitations are literally equipment. So once you start hitting those boundaries, that's the time to start asking questions about what can I do to take a little bit of pressure off of this part of my playing, a little bit of pressure off of this part. Make sense? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and I think it's kind of like, uh, I, I like to use the scientific process, you know, of, you know, have a, have a hypothesis and uh, have a, have a result in mind and then start to play with the parameters uh, and, and experiment from there. But, you know, it's the, yeah, I think a lot of times the, because I've done rep work for, for a few companies that, that, you know, people are like, well, you know, I want to change mouthpieces. Well, why? You know, why do you want to change mouthpieces? What is it about your current mouthpiece that you don't like? What is it about your current mouthpiece that you do like? What would you like it to do better for you? What, you know, what, what are your purposes? And most people just, you know, well, I want to be able to play higher. I want to play louder, or, you know, well, that's, that's really not the goal. You know, that's not the end. That, that's not what it's about. Uh, so yeah, get, getting really clear on those questions and then you can start playing with the the details. And I think that's the best way to, to go through the process. But who am I? I mean, there are so many people who have no access to experiment with equipment. I was one of them. Yeah. I mean, I, I was in Alaska. There was There's a great music store there called The Horn Doctor. I think it's called Alaska Music and Sound now. Incredible repairman. Good store. They had, you know, when I bought my Bach Stradivarius, there were probably three others there. You know, so I, I got to try some things. Um, but when I moved to Phoenix or Tempe to go to ASU, there's a huge store there called Milano Music, uh, and they have these great, great trumpet playing employees there, Josh Whitehouse and Josh Coffey, and it, you know, they know so much about equipment just from their own experience as professional trumpet players. I would go over there and just mess around and try stuff. They always had, like, all the pickets. They had all the curries. They had all the shires, the Bach. They had some Yamahas and stuff. It was, like... That, you know, I went there a little bit more frequently than I'd like to admit. I'm sure I'm not even close to their most frequent customer, or at least I wasn't. But now I'm like, it'd be nice to be that close to a big store, you know, that has access like that. Um, in Houston, there wasn't really a store like that. Yeah. I was like, how, I mean, another huge you know, metropolis. And so I spent a lot of my life not really having access to equipment. The only times I ever got to try stuff is if I bought it. Uh, and I almost everything I bought was used on Trumpet Herald. And so then you don't know how it's going to play or, you know, you have a general idea what the condition is going to be in from a picture, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and that was the beauty of, uh, well, now they're coming back uh, of going to the trade shows, you know, and being able to to go in. But even that, that's so difficult because 
you know, as expensive as it is to order two mouthpieces, uh, it's a lot more expensive to go to a show to try to to find a mouthpiece because you know you got to pay for transportation, you got to pay for lodging, you got to pay for your registration and food, and you know. And then there's what I think of as showroom chops, where like yeah. almost always I'll be, you know, I've, I've clearly times where I was in Greg's shop, we worked on something for hours, and I was like, yes, this is awesome. And I walk home and I play it and I play in the hall and I'm like, eh, it's not, I didn't finish it. Like, it's like, we're all, we were almost there. You know, this is incredible mouthpiece. I just wasn't clear enough of what I wanted because you're, you're psychologically in a different place when you're testing equipment versus when you're actually using it on the job. So that's another thing actually that I love about venture, but that I would encourage anybody to do is have kind of a little experimental process when you're trying new equipment. For me, I just keep it really simple. If I buy a new mouthpiece and I'm intending to use it in my main mouthpiece, I'll use it only for about two weeks just to you have to start a new relationship you're yeah. setting the new ground rules yeah. uh, is it hopefully it's not very different from what you're playing before but certainly there's going to be some adjustment really quick example the big change between what i was using before and now, and what i use from venture now is five thousandths of an inch in inner rim diameter five thousandths of an inch and so you'd think that would be a really small change but what what happens when you like make the mouthpiece physically wider a little bit you have slightly more lip that can or cannot vibrate that was being pinned down by a mouthpiece rim before you know two and a half thousands of an inch of lip on each side but guess what your lip is your lip tissue is extremely fine it's made up of very small skin cells that all need to be in a certain level of health to buzz healthily i guess and so even just a small change like that for me as a professional it took me several months before i felt like i was really really locked into it but two weeks was enough for me to know that it would work for sure uh so the process is get the new mouthpiece, try it only for two weeks. Do not pick up the old mouthpiece, not even once. And then at the end of the two weeks, you take out the two, have a little practice session where you compare the two, make your call. That's it. No more than that. And try to just stick to one new mouthpiece at a time. Because <laughs> you can't, yeah. I mean, there's no experimental process that allows for so many happening at once when you only have one pair of lips. Yeah, well, unless you have an extra pair of lips. So That would be cool. Does anybody have one they can sell me? An extra pair? I could use a few of those. I think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you swap out your lips like you would uh rim cups yeah i mean meat reeds you know they make they make all, you can have like 100 reeds in your bag if you're a clarinetist yeah. you know yeah. as soon as they'll have like extra ones sitting in in glasses of water and stuff yeah. i mean how yeah, unfair they, is that we gotta talk to somebody about that <laughs> no doug get on that can you do something <laughs> <laughs> oh, quickly. So the venture thing that I, the thing about venture that specifically solves this problem is that their prototyping process allows you to get actual parts that you can keep that are in the designs that you came up with um, that lets you evaluate over however long you need, you know, ideally just a few weeks, like I said, if that's what you really want in a final mouthpiece and you're not paying full price for those, like that's just part of the process of building your mouthpiece. Uh, I know that other manufacturers probably could do that and probably have offered stuff like that in the past, but it's never been as easy as it has been for me to do with venture. Just like, Hey, can I have a prototype of this, just this top part or just this back bar or whatever, try a few different things. Two weeks later, I'm like, Hey, this is what I want. Um, because I've had a chance to experiment with it. I've had a chance to bring it to work. I've had a chance to try it in a bunch of different situations, have people listen to me, not just like, Oh, I bought this new mouthpiece for 150 bucks. And so now I'm going to see if anybody likes it. <laughs> And then see if you can sell it. <laughs> right, exactly. Immediately afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So you can buy another mouthpiece. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, that that is it. I love the lead kit. I mean, I use that. Uh, you know, it's just nice to be able to to narrow things down and dial it in and use them on gigs because you know it doesn't doesn't matter how it sounds in the practice room. It, it matters how it's going to feel on the gig. So yeah, absolutely. And like you were saying about shows, like when you're at a conference, I mean, then you're competing with everyone playing their version of Pictures and Incredibles or whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so then you're only hearing yourself in competition with everyone else. So something that feels good may not sound the way you expect it to sound or whatever. And it's so hard to find a quiet place in those conferences. So, I mean, equipment is. Man, ideally, I'd love to do this someday. If I'm going to buy a new trumpet as a professional, I should just go to the factory and try a bunch of them and then pick one out because for me, it's going to hopefully be as long as possible a relationship. For a student, that's not necessary. Um, try your friend's horns, you know, at school, like if they'll let you, not with, you know, don't break any COVID protocols or anything, but generally, if you get the chance yeah. to try some other people's equipment, just do it. You have friends, just be careful with everybody's stuff <laughs> and they will be very nice and let you try whatever usually um as long as you wash the mouthpiece <laughs> there you go 
All right. Well, now it's time for our final segment. Uh, and this is brought to us by our friends uh, at Robinson's Remedies. This is the Robinson's Remedies Rapid Fire Round, a series of questions that are all over the place. So I would need to get your quickest response to oh, uh, a real <laughs> challenge for me <laughs> uh, to this uh, barrage of questions. So, John, are you ready? Oh, yeah. All right, here we go. First question. Who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player? My parents. Oh, okay. What's your favorite book? Oh, man. Uh, the Stand, I've read twice by Stephen King. That I guess that has to be my favorite. It's the first one that came out. Also, lead, read a lot of books by Arthur C. Clarke. Really super into hard sci-fi. Okay, cool. Uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? I had a problem with Whiplash. Sorry, everybody. I really, <laughs> it was tough. It was tough. My dad was like, you got to watch this movie. It's just like real life. And I was like, I'm watching it. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> do not get in a car accident and then go straight to a gig. Okay, please. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you like to be? Statistician. Oh. Next Gen Stats with John. Uh, what's your favorite drink? Wow, that's a great question. Um, cortado, or actually a one in one, which is like you get a, a, a shot of espresso and then a cortado next to it. So you get espresso with cream and without. Oh, wow. I'll have to try that at some point. <laughs> um, you could have a dinner party, and at this dinner party, you could invite any three people in the world. Any three living people could be guests at your party. Who would you want them to be? Andy Lott, Dave Monette, and Bob Malone. Ooh, my, <laughs> my, my. <laughs> you didn't have to think about that. <laughs> and that devious laugh. Um, the same dinner party, you have three extra chairs. You can invite any three people from history. Any three people no longer with us? Who would you mm. want to have? Oh, man. I'm going to hate myself for not remembering this guy's name. The uh, trumpet player from, I believe it was Haydn's orchestra, the one with the coiled trumpet in the picture. Anton Weidegger might have been his name. Man, I'd love to talk to that guy. What was it like to play trumpet when <laughs> you're not only like performing for Haydn or right, you know, playing his music or whatever, but also you, you play in like palaces and stuff. I mean, it's crazy. Um, Arnold Jacobs and Vincent Bach. Oh, okay. Very good. Uh, lacquer, plated, or raw? Plated. Silver plated. All my answers are silver plated. Okay. What's your favorite quote? Oh, let me think for a second. <sighs> this is the part we edit out, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think frequently in quotes. Um, For me, my biggest thing is just the initiation. I hate to say it, but Nike, just do it. For me, it's just getting started. Once I get started, it's like rolling off a cliff. I mean, it's hard to stop, but getting started. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's legit. All right. What's your greatest fear? Hmm. You know, it's nothing really about me personally. My, my greatest fear is just that you know, humanity con continues to descend into being ultimately extremely distracted by things that will not keep us alive much longer. <laughs> I, 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 I am, you know, it, it's, we all spend so much time focused on the, the incredible number of screens around us. It's not even close to an original thought, but it also makes us think differently about ourselves and our lives and our capabilities as humans. Like, think about it. What would you do if tomorrow the internet and the elect and electricity was not here for you anymore? What would you do? What skills do you have that you can use? I don't have a lot of them myself. I would love to like start to learn some of these things, but it, that's 
that's a fear of mine. Like almost all the things we've built are the benefit of having an incredibly advanced society of humans. Like music itself is, is literally just a celebration of high culture. These incredible artistic masterpieces people have created because we surpassed the need to, you know, make sure that we were eating enough every day and getting us sleep and have the proper amount of shelter and protected from diseases and all those things, all these huge building blocks that were put before us. Um, we take them all for granted. And almost all of our lives are focused on building more on top of that, which is what is so great about living in the modern day is that we get to see everything like that happen on the internet. But also, when do you build the building so tall and you, uh, and you have to go back and look at the foundation again and rebuild it? Right. Well, that's very profound. I like that answer. All right. Not a lightning answer necessarily, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you could be granted one superpower. What would it be? The ability to replay any moment I had seen in his, uh, in my life. Uh, the reason is I record everything I play, even pocket recordings from when I'm in orchestra concerts or rehearsals, uh, just because I obsess a little bit and I always want to go back and see how something went. There's the image in my mind, but I don't really know how it went until I heard a recording. Thanks, Charlie Geyer, for encouraging me to record everything. So just take the actual phone out of the equation because I forget to record. <laughs> Play back anything. Yeah. All right. Total recall. Yeah, that's the word. Another horrible movie. Uh, <laughs> what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? I know it's... <laughs> I spend my entire career between low f sharp and like high d or something i, I don't know i mean i i if i if you asked high school version of me you'd think that the range between high c and double c was super duper important <laughs> yeah okay uh what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most underrated intonation okay um you can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music what would it be Don't take it too seriously. Let the music wash over you. Right. And you're going to give yourself one piece of advice about life. Be patient. Be patient. Relax. Take a deep breath. The fact that you're worrying about all those things shows that you're going to be okay. All right. And final question. John, what do you want your legacy to be? So my whole life, I've been very much in the camp of, I didn't really want to have a legacy because I didn't feel like myself individually is important. And like the stuff I say is going to be important. Um, I have a little bit of a different understanding of the word legacy now. It's not just about self-aggrandizement or recognition for what you do. It's about contributing to that ever building human culture tower we were just talking about. Um, that, I guess that is the definition of legacy. Uh, so for me, I hope it's, a positive one. I hope people learn things about equipment that brings them happiness. I got a message from someone yesterday that was literally like, hey, I've been playing an orchestra for 25 years. And during the pandemic, I tried to downsize my equipment because I was, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm getting older and it'd be nice to play something a little bit more efficient. And then watching your video the other day made me pull out my original 1CH rim that I got from Phil Smith. And lo and behold, I sound like me again. And thank you for allowing me to reconnect that this not me sounds like. That's, I mean, that's it for me. Like just a little thing like that. Somebody just having a tiny positive impact from something I did. That's all. That's all. I, I don't care if, if it's recorded in history or people remember me, but as long as somebody felt that I did my job. Yeah. Well, and I think at the end of the day, that's, the, that's really all we all should really strive for, you know, just, just to make, make the world a little better because of uh, our, in, our influence, our impact, our experiences. So I can tell you that you definitely made my day much better and I enjoyed getting to talk to you and meet you. I have, uh, you know, I've admired you from afar. Uh, <laughs> That's too kind. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, my mom lives down South. So uh, maybe the next time I'm making a, a trip uh, down to uh, South Carolina, I'll swing through North Carolina. Please do. Only 30 minutes from the border over here. So oh, there you go. 
That's good. Yeah, I, I'm I'm familiar with there. I used to live in Tennessee, so I used to drive through nice. that area quite a bit. Nice. Uh, but but thanks, man. And I really, uh, again, I, I really enjoy what you're doing. I look forward to more uh, John talks trumpet because, uh, like, as I said, there each episode is not only entertaining; it's extremely educational. I've learned so much from you, and I'm looking forward to to learning more from you as time progresses. <laughs> thanks so much, Jose. It's been a real pleasure. All right. And uh, thank you for joining us uh, for this episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang. Make sure that you uh, like, subscribe, support the show sponsors, uh, because, you know, they're trumpet players and they're, you know, they're just trying to make it a little easier for all of us. So uh, make sure you, you support them and uh, make sure you, you if you haven't checked out John's channel, make sure you subscribe to that as well, because uh, you, you're not going to you're not going to regret it. Trust me. Trust me on that. So. As always, folks, peace and slide grease. We out. Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of valve oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signal. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Guru's Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group.